Um, welcome to Belfast. I think uh, you know, there was a, a bit of a welcome last night with the comedy night, and Tim's invited you all here and said, welcome to Belfast. But I think as um, the first member of staff to get the welcome is here, it's, it's really good to see such a good turnout, great group of people over from the rest of the UK as well. And today, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about what activism looks like in Northern Ireland. Uh, and Northern Ireland's a really interesting place. As Andrew Copson said earlier, you know, we're really leading the way now in terms of what we can achieve in rights. Just in the last few months, we've seen Northern Ireland overtake the rest of the UK when it comes to teachers' uh, fair employment. Um, the, two years ago, we saw the changes when it came to same-sex marriage and abortion rights. Uh, four years ago, we managed to secure um, humanist weddings here, so as they're legally recognised, whereas the rest of the UK, apart from Scotland, is still sort of lagging behind and trying to get there. So Northern Ireland has become an incredibly forward-thinking place, uh, and it, my time in the last six years with Humanist UK has um, been pretty amazing. Um, I've learned an awful lot, uh, and, and I've met an awful lot of people. Um, including some of these people who are on stage here today. Uh, and, and when we're working in Northern Ireland on the things that we are, we find that because it's such a, a small place in a small country, um, we can work very effectively and we can work in conjunction with other people to really affect real change. And today, we have some people on stage who are doing their thing, you know, um, and, and most of us are not new to it, but they're very new projects that I think we're working on. I think that was what we wanted to sort of show you today. So first of all, what we're going to do is get our panel here to introduce themselves. We'll start at the far end with Katie. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Katie Richardson. Um, in my work life, I'm a musician, composer, uh, and I um, set up an, organized, uh, an initiative, I guess, a voluntary initiative called Safe and Sound, and we work to um, amplify underrepresented voices in music and build a safe, strong, connected, creative sector built on equality, diversity, and respect. Holy. Hi everyone, I'm Holly Lester, I'm a DJ and I run record labels um, and I now also work in uh, lobbying and campaigning for the nighttime economy with Boyd. Um, we set up an organisation called Free the Night just over a year ago together and yeah, we're, we're campaigning for more <coughs> progressive nightlife in Northern Ireland. Virginia. Hi, I'm Virginia and I'm an author and a public speaker and I founded thefeminishop.com and basically if it's anything feminist related, I'm involved and volunteer with different things, but I'm setting up now a parenting network about progressive parenting, just to bring some of these ideas into schools and just child's lives. Hi, I'm Becky Bellamy, one uh, <coughs> uh, co-founder of Another World Belfast, along with Connor here. Uh, we run a not-for-profit CIC that provides toiletries and underwear and same clothing for people in Belfast and beyond that are struggling with homelessness or hardship. And uh, we are a secular organisation and our aim is to bring uh, a greater secular uh, representation into the third sector. I'm... Uh part of that and co-founder of Another World Belfast. We have a message to show some love. You might see it in and around the city. And uh, we have another mantra of uh, do no harm, take no shit. Good. That's the way. That's what we like. Um, I think we might have to take that one on as well. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the conversation here today with Virginia because Virginia is not originally from Northern Ireland. When I was talking to her the other night, I asked her, first of all, um, what did you think when you first got here? And I think for maybe people who have just come to the city for the first time, Virginia's um, comments on what she thought when she first came here are very relevant. So, Virginia, to start, what was your first impression when you landed in Northern Ireland and what, what we're dealing with? Well, the first time I came, it was for a holiday. My husband is from here, and I look at him and said, I'm not going to live here ever. And he said, I'm not going to come back here ever. And here we are. Um, so I've been living here for eight years now. And I guess um, my first impression was that it was, it, I, it was like a lot of people I met were like, is this the past crisis? Is this what you brought me to live? Are we living in literally another century? I felt like I was having conversations that I, I don't think my grandparents will have had. Uh, like, wow. Like, I had to call my mom and tell mom, here, the Catholics are the progressive ones. <laughs> this is how bad it is. <laughs> uh, uh, and she was like, oh, 
get out. Um, but I guess, like, um, I think it's a matter of where you move and your bubble. Uh, I find that Northern Ireland is full of people that really, really care. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find that the passion in this country to change things and move forward makes you believe that literally there's 200 years different. Some people are living in the future, some people are living in the past. <laughs> We're all sharing the city. And it's exciting how fast and how much people give themselves to change things. Um, and it's a very known country. I think there's, it's a really, really interesting place to live if you're in, in social things because a lot is happening and there's pushing in, in every direction. Um, so yeah, it's interesting being part and, of it. Um, when you decided that there were things that you wanted to act on, um, you can tell us a little bit about what they were, but what was the drive, I guess, behind that for, for, for yourself? And, and what did you find? Uh, and how did you go about sort of taking those sort of first steps in action? Why, why did you do it and what were your first steps? Well, it's fine because I, myself, I, if you ask me, 15 years ago, I would rather die than consider myself a feminist. Like, I was not a feminist, that was not for me. And then I started to learn more, but I think when I came here, I had a big shock about sexism, mm -hmm. um, which is very interesting because now that I live here, I come back home in Spain and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of sexism, it's just different. Mm -hmm. And it's just the Every country has a lot of different way to show that. So I guess there's been a lot of unlearning and relearning. And I am a big advocate of anger. So I think once you're angry about something and you see something, it's very difficult, or it should be, but apparently it's not, <laughs> to do nothing about it. Um, I think sometimes we believe that we need to do something huge in order to make a difference, but I am where I am because people challenged me in my beliefs. People took the time to prove me wrong, to call me <coughs> in, um, to show me their perspective to, and just get me out of my bubble. Mm -hmm. So I think those conversations are also activism. Those, you know, just calling out a joke or saying, tell me more about it, it's yeah. activism. And, and sometimes we are put off because it feels like if we're not doing something huge and starting an organization and just you know getting in front of a tree so it doesn't get, then, then there's nothing for us to do. Yeah. But there's so much gray, and I think that's where we all need to tap in. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, I think you know, we've spoken about this from a Humanist UK perspective as well. It's, it's, it's even the little bits that people can do, even discuss, discussing the issue, and as we were sort of saying earlier, recognizing and, you know, Figuring out the language to use so as you're advocating well is, is really important. Katie, to move on to you a little bit because uh, you know what uh, what uh, Virginia's doing is also quite sort of relevant in the sort of area of work that you have. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit more again about you know the reasons behind setting up Safe and Sound and what what it's specifically for. So I mean, it, it was layered. the uh, The idea for something like that had been in my head for a long time to do something um, in music. Um, for underrepresented voices, um, partly through my own experience of being patronised, you know, when I was working in sound or, you know, um, just every day in, in work um, and people not taking me seriously as, as a woman in music, um, especially when I got into technical realms like sound design and working in theatres and things, um, <clears throat> and how much I wanted to Change, try and change that for younger generations. Um, and then in 2020, when we were locked down, a, a kind of accounts of abuse started to come out in the music sector in Northern Ireland from very young women. And it really triggered me because it was something that I had seen and experienced through my 20s. Um, and I started to talk to others and we were like, we have to do something, we can't be in our 30s sitting and knowing that this has been going on for ages and knowing now that we have more confidence to speak and to do something and not do something but we had absolutely no idea where to start we had no idea what to do we just started to get together i remember the first meeting we had we just all cried in a park like a meter apart <laughs> but but it, there was just this real energy and this real drive and passion to and, and like you know, within a few months, we'd set up Safe and Sound. 
we'd started to host panel events. A couple of months later, I was starting to uh, take part in like um, safe space committees with the Ivers in London and like do have these conversations across the world with people. It was so inspiring. It was such a quick journey from like going, I feel angry about this to suddenly be, being part of conversations of how can we make this change, how can we change this? And I think um, it was just such a learning curve and it's still a learning curve. And um, now we're, we're running lots of events. We're running lots of panels. We did a whole series around abuse last year. We worked with Women's Aid. Um, we are um, developing a, a, a kind of a code of conduct for um, creative, um, uh, you know, for, for the music sector here. We're working on a safe space charter for venues um, and hun like tons of other things. Yeah, so started working on the transport on the uh, stakeholder groups. Yes, as well. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, you know, I'm now I, I'm be, like it's just opened so many conversations with other people, and I think also from a Northern Irish perspective, some of those rooms now that we're being welcomed into because really we're artist focused where we, we work with the whole industry but <clears throat> we for me i th we we you know safe and sound is sis we think of it about like being big sisters mm -hmm. and or younger sisters like they're, they're people of all ages in that group it's about being this kind of supportive i had like supportive feminist presence i suppose in the music sector because i didn't have that when i was in my 20s uh, there were very few others and so it's just about trying to kind of literally change things from from the ground up yeah, yeah. so yeah when you said that i mean what what i find in northern ireland as well is that we have a lot of grassroots activism there's a very sort of strong sort of I always call it a punk influence. It's yeah. that makeshift, let's, yeah. let's do something, let's, let's take action. And then you do, you find, because communities in Northern Ireland are quite close. You, know, you have close friends, you've got people that you can go out and interact with, that you can actually take action somewhat quickly at times. Um, what projects do you have coming up, Katie? Uh, OK, um, what projects have we got coming up? So we just, well, we just finished a project with Women's Work Festival. Um, we um, hosted um, a, a kind of audio experience called I Believe Her. And then we had a, a panel discussion afterwards with Reclaim the Agenda and Stop Street Harassment NI. And that was our last big project. And we've just welcomed in about 10 other people who we kind of did an open call for people who wanted to get involved with the initiative. So now we're starting to kind of listen to what they want to do. We're, we're talking about an all ages pride gig at, at the minute that we're trying to get organized. Um, and at, at the minute we're in a very kind of, it feels like we're in a, a transitional phase um, where we're just trying to, uh, the conversations are all still going on. We're still developing ideas for events, um, but there's nothing apart from the kind of code of conduct and the the um, safe space charter and things like that, we've no big kind of like events coming up yeah. or anything, but it's just kind of about the work that we're, the conversations we're continuing to have, trying to, bringing in these kind of new voices and trying to find out, I suppose it's like channeling the kind of, trying to channel the activism that's happening in music anyway, yeah. trying to Support, like facilitate that in one space, trying to bring it together. And for people who I can see are like these amazing young activists saying, "We're here. if you have an idea, come to us. And we'll, as a team then, help to facil facilitate that rather than you having to do, you know, having to work out how to do it in your own. So yeah. that's kind of what we're, we're, we're working on. Yeah. It's just trying to... Yeah. That's great, that's great. Um, yeah, one of, one of, I had a conversation with Katie the other night and what was really interesting is we were sort of talking about the ethics and the values of, of, of her organisation and of Safe and Sound and I had, I had asked the question, where do you get those sort of values from? And what was really funny is um, Katie's actually the daughter of Norman Richardson, who is, we have set up the Coalition for Inclusive Education with and I've worked with on the Interfaith Forum for about the last eight years. And as soon as she said, my dad's Norman Richardson, he is one of the most welcoming men I know. He, he welcomed us onto the Interfaith Forum in Northern Ireland. He's been a, a big advocate for the work that we do here in Northern Ireland and has been uh, an excellent sort of advocate for integrated education and inclusive education for 
for years and years. So when I said to Katie, I was like, so where do you, where do you get those uh, that ethical drive? And she said, well, you'd mentioned the interfaith form. Do you know my father, Norman Richards? And as soon as she said that, I was like, oh, I totally understand where you get that from. <laughs> so it's, 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 and again, it's really interesting that the community in Northern Ireland's tiny. You know, you meet people all the time where you know you've got these connections. And even between Holly and, and Katie as well, Holly, you attended some of the Safe and Sound bits. Maybe you want to talk a little bit yeah. about that, first of all. I think I'm either a member or supporter of Katie's organisation. I'm not too sure. I was one of the original people that you she were reached one out our to. You were our champions, yes. kind of, yeah. Um, so, and I, I know Joe really well, which is Katie's colleague mm -hmm. who also works in the Arts Council. Um, yeah, as I said, my background is in, is in DJing and music, so that's sort of the link there. But with, with Free the Night, um, I guess there's a similar theme here. It just was sort of born out of my anger and frustration at mm -hmm. the way things are here with um, the government and nightlife and <coughs> that sort of relationship and lack of understanding. <coughs> yeah. um, the, the real sort of... Um, the main reason that we started, I guess, was due to the licensing review which was taking place. So it was basically the first review of um, alcohol licensing, which had taken place in 25 years here in Northern Ireland. So very, um, very far behind in terms of UK and the rest of Europe. Um, our licensing is probably the most restrictive in Europe. So there was a review taking place and that was the real sort of um, reason that we got together and wanted to try and make some changes and try and, I suppose, get our points of view across as creatives in, in the scene. Um, there's about 10 of us on the team yeah. and we're mainly from a, a creative background. So we're coming from it as well, from um, a creative sort of focus. And um, we, we did manage to get some small changes, but. Unfortunately, it was in the later stages, so we're still it's something we're still working on now. Um, we've got a big review coming up this year with the licensing, um, but luckily we've made so much progress in between yeah. launching and that initial stage to now that we're now in a much better position with the council and with the government, and yeah. hopefully I mean, we'll I be able to make some yeah, changes. What, what we found as well was that there was, there was no voice for the creative no. scene, you know, especially in that sort of after 11 p.m., at night, you know, a lot of people in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland sort of don't understand how important um, sort of dance floors and spaces in the evening are in Northern Ireland. For many years, even during the Troubles, it was the place that people came and they congregated in spaces, yeah. they got to meet each other. They were inclusive places, they were diverse places, and they still are. They're probably the most diverse and inclusive places in Northern Ireland. Certainly for me, as a young man going out in the late 90s and early noughties, it was a case of this is where I meet people, this is where I meet people with different opinions and different ideas. And then also I think over the last year with doing this with Holly, we've realized as well, these are the places where we find fellowship and, and friendship and, and, and where we actually probably put the world to right at three or four o'clock in the morning after a party, thinking what can we do to make change? So all of those, even these initial things that we do now here, and I do here with um, Northern Ireland Humanists, probably came from those conversations and parties when you're trying to put the world to right. Um, and I think, you know, for us anyhow, that's, we've, we set this up 12 months ago with Free the Night, and, and since then, it's uh, like yourself, Katie, it's been a, a sort of a, a trajectory of going straight up. Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about those things that have happened in the last number of weeks. Um, the last number of weeks, yeah, they've been pretty important for us actually because Belfast City Council have um, really solidified their relationship with us and I think that's quite rare for a lot of campaigning groups at this stage. Um, we're still really young, so to have their support and you know they really want our involvement um, with a, f a few different things actually. So the main, the main thing is um, that they're setting up a task force for the nighttime economy, which is huge. And then second to that, something that's been sort of um, running in the background has become a bigger issue is the transport infrastructure. It's, um, it's, it's really, really bad in Northern Ireland. If you spend some time here this weekend, you'll probably see that. Um, so that's, that's become a really pressing issue recently with nighttime safety. And we've just had to sort of jump on it, even though it was planned for later this year. We, we're a very small team. We don't have a lot of capacity, so we wanted to wait, but it's just become really yeah. pressing. And now we have the support of um, the council and that as well. They've 
we set up a transport group um, two weeks ago yeah. that Katie is on and a couple of others, um, maybe 10 others. Yeah, and um, the council are now contacting us wanting to actually be involved. So yeah. it's, yeah, we, it's we, a really we good step. Two, two emails last week. One was uh, the, there's going to be a cross-departmental uh, stakeholder group set up to focus on the nighttime creative economy. And then yesterday or the day before yesterday, I got a, another email saying, oh, we heard you're setting up a transport stakeholder group because, yeah, after, it was funny, my mother, we were out having dinner the other night, my mother said, oh, I used to go to that venue and, you know, I had to get the last bus home at 11 o'clock at night and that was like 50 years ago and I'm like, still 11 o'clock for the last bus home. You know, and she was like, really? Um, so, yeah, we, we and, and the, the, one of the bigger issues is that, you know, we had people who were coming out of festivals a few weeks ago and, and it was like 12 o'clock it ended and there were people milling about the streets until three in the morning trying to get away home. It's not safe and even Belfast as it is, although it's, we're getting there, it's becoming a better place, it's becoming a more welcoming place. It's still a bit of a sketchy city to walk across in the early hours of the morning, especially for, for women and minorities. You know, it's not, it doesn't feel like the safest place. So part of you know, the work that we do is thinking about how do we make this better? How do we think about lighting? And how do we think about moving on, on your foot from one side of the city to another and feeling safe? And then also on top of that, the, the transport issues. And as I say, just two days ago, we got contacted. <coughs> we hear you're doing a transport stakeholder group. Could you bring this in and make, build it into, the, yeah. into this interdepartmental group that we're doing? So we, I think we feel that we've really sort of got our foot in the door very quickly. Um, yeah. And even in that, we, as you were saying, Katie, we've now been, we were invited out to Bristol and Montreal. We came back from Montreal not so long ago because they're really interested in the angle that we're taking on it as well. For a lot of organizations, and we've had this conversation as well with Becky and Connor, <coughs> um, you know, it's, it's very business oriented. You know, when you think about the nighttime economy, you think about, oh, business and money and you know, people coming in and spending money. But we've taken a different angle. We're saying, no, we're a charity and this is about culture and this is about cultural rights. I mean, for me, anyhow, when I came on and did this with Holly, it was like, I can't argue for people to make money, but I can argue for rights. And I think that's, that's the angle we've gone on. And also, it really connected with, with, the, with our civil servants. When we went in and said, you know, we're pissed off that all the money for culture is going to these divisive and exclusive cultures. What about this? What about these inclusive places? They're inclusive for LGBT communities, for minorities, for everybody. They've totally bought into that. They totally bought into the idea that we're saying this is culture. These spaces are culturally uh, important places, and and they have. They've really. I mean, the, the conversation now with us was, well, we've a new mandate, you know, in May. So your foot's in the door. Let's get you involved and let's get doing these things. So, um, I think yeah. For, for Holly, I'm just really uh, proud of the team of people that are working around us, and I think again, that's that's really really important. I think for anybody here thinking about taking on action and, and taking action, you have to surround yourself by good people and people that are passionate about the cause as well, but don't think that you can't do it. Connor and Becky are together um, here today and, and they work on a lot of these projects together. Maybe tell us about uh, uh, Show Some Love campaign and, and another word Belfast. Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure thing. So we, uh, we met in 2010, just as I was moving to London. I worked for Diageo for 13 years and uh, Connor was just a couple of years before he was about to travel around the world. We reconnected in 2017 uh, to set up at the time what we considered to be a pop-up as a fundraiser for the Rainbow Project. And uh, a pop up that just never ended. Yeah, <laughs> we're not getting we're not getting flights never, to Canada. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to start campaigns, so we can start. We're going to start traveling. Yeah, we'll go to Tokyo. <laughs> no. So we got to get we uh, got together to uh, out of out of Connor set up a pop up uh, salon with the intention to give something back to Belfast while he was really only a t on a temporary stop from his global travels, volunteering and working in different humanitarian contexts. And he uh, Keo had to come back for, for medical reasons. While he was back, he wanted to set up uh, a project to do something positive for, you know, for his mental health and things like that. And he put a message on Facebook to say, um, I'm gonna set up this, this project. I need help with hairstylists and makeup artists. And at the time, I had definitely what I would call extra capacity in my life uh, because I was uh, managing director of a, of a retail firm at the time, which, which I enjoyed, but it wasn't my passion. It wasn't my love. And I was starting to definitely start to become aware of the issues with inequality and the issues with uh, 
hatred in the world and anger and all the rest of it. So I'd, got, I'd said to Connor, um, yes, I'm not a hairstylist, I'm not a makeup artist, but I can do a main spreadsheet and I can manage a project. He was like, I don't need any of that. <laughs> and then it turned out he did. But we got back together again um, and uh, set up what was to be a small short-term project. And uh, we were shocked ourselves by, you know, I don't think it's ever the appropriate word to say the success of a project that's addressing need, mm -hmm. that's giving, you know, but in terms of the public response to it and the ability for us to uh, help to be able to address some of the needs of the uh, homelessness and refugee asylum seeker community at the time um, and the LGBT community. Uh, we realised that there was something sort of magic and special in terms of the way that we worked together. And, uh, and we were very much in a place of, uh, you know, use what's in your hand, use your existing skills. So long story, keep it very, very short. Life over the next few months was able to sort of morph itself around where I came from working in a sort of very well paid corporate career had all of the trappings that come with that, including the big house, the big car, and all of the bills and the direct debits mm -hmm. that go with all of that too. So uh, I thought that that was my life set and I could, and you know, why would anybody ever step away from, you know, hitting all of those milestones? Uh, but uh, what we, whenever I decided to be able to work with Connor full time, we decided rather than immediately stepping into setting up a charity, we would set up a CIC so that we could use the skills that we already have as well, so that we could set up something that was, you know, in essence, a social enterprise, but in effect, it was a, a charity. There's no, you know, we're, we're, even in terms of wages and things, like we get paid for one week a month at the minute, but whenever we eventually- That's, that's a real that's, improvement. That's progress. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're buying non-reduced bread on a Sunday. Uh, yeah. Right, 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 yeah. <laughs> but stepping away from all of the trappings of that, um, of the, the life that I had had, uh, part of the journey was us moving to Ibiza for a summer and living in a caravan. Uh, while we, we had created a, a product, a coffee scrub product, that we wanted to sell in order to put the funds back in to uh, be able to fund our project so that we could continue to provide toiletries and underwear and whatever else. You know, we weren't very uh, precious about what the specific thing was. We just knew that we had lots of skills from our previous lives and instead of using those skills to be able to basically fund ourselves and... Uh, you know, create our private businesses. What we wanted to do was take all of those skills and uh, take all of the profits from that and be able to turn it into means to help people uh, locally. And uh, we've kind of, uh, we've, it's kind of just, we've learned very much as, as we go. Connor's experience, um, you can probably speak better about this, you know, in, uh, in Indonesia, for example. One of the things that we were very aware of was uh, you're talking about business, is there's, uh, there's corporate social responsibility, which is something that I think is a is, can be a force for good. But corporate responsibility, we should remember, is essentially marketing. You know, um, there's the next level down, which is, you know, social enterprise. Um, and social enterprise at the minute is a very broad category in that there's not a lot of, unless you've locked yourself down as a CIC, which is kind of the only okay social enterprise as far as we're concerned, Social enterprise should not be a means for somebody to be able to use a cause or something to get personally wealthy, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that is sort of, there's a, there's a real ethical question within that. And then obviously we've got charity as well. And none of it should really have to exist. We should live in a society where everybody has enough, but that's a whole other panel, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have learned as we go. We, we looked, we came into the project aiming to have as little ego as we could. You know, we came from both very different uh, experiences and we want, what we wanted to do was be, as we described it, like, you know, kind of bulletproof, into, and that's, a, you know, welcome to NI, but like bulletproof in terms of our accountability. Do you know what I mean? And actually, it's one of the things that I've heard in each of the other speakers talking about is actually what you're delivering within your projects as well is a voice of accountability. And that's one thing that we share as well in what we do, although we are, uh, you know, an, an aid project, you know, but we're an aid project that we aim to do differently, you know, or show some love message. Do not mistake that for the message to be kind. Do be kind, of course, but show some love is about action, you know, and that's what we're here to talk about today. It's about uh, uh, standing up for yourself. It's about standing up for other people. It's what Virginia said about, you know, it could be that you're a voice online. You know, it could be that you're listening to the, the keyboard warriors on a Belfast Live or Belfast Telegraph, you know, conversation. It's providing an alternative voice. Mm -hmm. And for us in the third sector, it's providing an alternative secular voice. I mean, it's for us as well, it's an alternative secular queer 
voice, yeah. non-partisan, all the rest of it. But uh, accountability and uh, the ability to try and think differently and do things a wee bit differently yeah. and also get away from solemnity and worthiness and all of that mm. sort of boring stuff that we tend to all get trapped in. You know, we, we try to do things with joy and fun and creativity yeah. and, uh, you know, maybe the words of, and this is going <coughs> to uh, trigger you, Katie, sorry, but the words of anarchism and feminism and socialism <laughs> that are, sorry, Katie edited this, Katie created this beautiful soundscape of a film called Let Us Be Seen that you, you must watch. And uh, I used that exact same sentence in it. So Katie's really heard, triggered by that I've heard sentence. heard it hundreds of times yeah. at this point. <laughs> yeah. We've heard it thousands. Thousands, yeah. 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 <laughs> but those words, you know, those are words that in my previous life, so, you know, shocker, I said about the, the previous life of the money and things. I was a corp was conservative voter. So I was, uh, I was a, um, a capitalist, you know. I was, like, totally on that path. And uh, now I am probably the complete polar opposite of that because now um, with the work that we do and what we've seen, and honestly with going to live in a caravan in Ibiza for four months and realising that actually you don't need very much stuff to be happy. You know, it's like the opposite of more is not less, which I think is a fear that comes with the word socialism. Okay. The opposite of more is enough, you know, and that concept of having enough and being able to actually also then create a culture where we are collective, we're not in, you know, in an individual sense, yeah. where we can think a wee bit more about other people and we're not in this like constant sense of competition. Mm -hmm. And even I think that that comes with uh, the third sector as well. Yeah. Frustratingly, yeah. is that there is often a sense of competition and sort of like, rather than the will and the need to work together and be collaborative and, and share skills and all the rest yeah. of it, yeah. that uh, I think, we try to approach things a wee bit differently that way, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I think when putting this panel together as well, it was important for me to have people on stage who are actually thinking about how do we include other people and how do we listen? You know, I think it's, it's very important. I mean, for Holly and I, when we started Free the Night, for, for one of the first things we did was have discussion groups with different people from different parts of the creative community to find out what it was they needed and, and also to to work through that, those processes of, okay, well, you know, we know what we think people need, but is that actually what they need? And is that what they want? Is that what they want from us? Um, but also, you know, I, I said this earlier, um, when we first set up in Northern Ireland for, for Northern Ireland Humanists, we met with who was uh, Pavan, who was then uh, our Director of Public Affairs, and, and Richie Thompson was there as well. And one of the conversations I had with Pavan was, should we not be trying to get all of these activists on the same page and working in the same way? And she was like, no, no, no. You want them to throw as much shit until something sticks. Everybody should be doing their own thing and feel confident in doing it. And should also be able to talk to other people who are maybe doing things in a different way and support each other still. Not point the finger and go, mm, I don't like the way you're doing that or you're maybe doing that a bit wrong. It's about really getting onto the same page in order to create real change. Connor. It's like uh, a few of the guys, the, these guys have been saying, like you were saying about calling in, that's really important that we can call people in and we're not, nece we're not necessarily always in a space of shouting people down. And then in what Katie said as well, uh, it's, there, there's, a, there's a place for all that we have different uh, maybe perspectives or that we are approaching it in a different way. There is a place to then learn from each other and to know that you can say, actually, we've we did something very similar to this. If you want this pack that we created, or if you want those words, if you want this contact, it's the opposite of that competition. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's, it's really working together because if, if we can't work together, we really can't make change happen. And whatever the opposing force is, if it's religion or it's capitalism or it's politicians or it's God knows what in this country, um, they, they want that and they, they need that. You know, so it is, it's important as much as possible to, well, to show some love, yeah. you know. Yeah. Very well said. And I, and I guess as well, that sort of showing some love for all of us is also about how we function with capacity. So, you know, for Northern Ireland Humanists, and what I will say is this is a call out for volunteering. If anybody wants to volunteer for Northern Ireland Humanists, by all means, you know, speak to some of our, our staff and team members and we can tell you today what, what, we're, what we're doing. Um, but I think the same goes for everybody here. You know, we're always, looking to have more capacity. Um, because I know from our perspective, it's like we're, we're doing this all um, in our free time. You know, next week, Holly and I'll spend every, every, every evening trying to think about the music strategy that's coming out and how do we get our, 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 our members to respond to that. Uh, and I think for everybody else, it's very much, 
it's a full-time thing for us, but we do it um, uh, voluntarily. And if other people are passionate about the things that you've heard here today, contact them, get in touch with them, see if we can do it. And the other thing is, I think, and this I'd spoken to yourselves about this and, and to Katie about this, if there are projects that you're thinking about, if there's something that you, you've taken from this and you think, I might be able to do something like that, or say, for instance, where Holly and I are thinking about dance floor culture, maybe it's a case that theatre is important to you and it's not getting enough support. Maybe it's a case that it's some other end of the arts or some other spectrum of things that is important to you, but you feel that you know, change isn't being made on it. Well, if you honestly think that there's something wrong and something needs to change, I can guarantee you there's another half a dozen people at least who are thinking the same thing. And if you can, maybe if you ever want to speak to any of us or any of our team about the, the thoughts or ideas that you have, I think we'd all be happy to give any advice that we can and, and support <coughs> in any way we can. Um, but yeah, can you give a round of applause for our panel, please? Um, I think, I think we're opening for uh, a bit of a Q&A. Uh, am I right in saying that? Yeah, so any, any questions from the audience? I'd like to ask the nighttime team if you're involved with the pub folk music scene at all and how is that going in Northern <laughs> Ireland, in Belfast? Well, that, that is, I mean, it's a, it's a good question because the, for us anyhow, we've tried to expand the group of people who are thinking about what the nighttime economy is now. For things like Irish trad music, there is support behind that. There are venues here that already exist that are specifically for Irish folk music. They, they exist and there's, because things like culture, like trad music, and generally things like theater and our orchestra, they're all the things that are thought about as culture yeah. in Northern Ireland. It's much what, better understood already here. Yeah. Um, I, I, like, I can't really say from experience, I come from a different um, sort of background, but I think those sorts of uh, genres and themes are, are really um, well represented and understood and pushed and, you know, they, yeah. they're they, a large they, part of culture yeah. already in, in And they also in have Ireland. a good, um, for want of a better funding. word, a lobbying, a lot of lobbying, lobbying and funding and, already. Yeah. They have people who are out there speaking for them. For us, yeah. it was a case of looking at all those um, promoters that are running events across our city, you know, that go later into the nighttime, really after 11, 12 o'clock at night, that we were thinking about, you know, where is the support, support for, those, for those areas? Um, but yes, I mean, what we would always want to do is we want to have as many collective voices really saying and pushing the same thing. Music is music. For me, there's only two types of music, good music and bad music. Uh, so I, I, I sort of, um, yeah, we would want to always be bringing more voices in across the spectrum. And in actual fact, we even sort of spoke about this in terms of comedians as well, you know. How, you know, where do they sit you know, in, the, in the evening, in the nighttime economy? You know, can venues be multi-purpose? At the minute, one of the issues is because everything closes at three, they can only put one event on in one venue in the evening. But if we had longer times to experience culture, you could have rock bands and comedy nights and, um, for want of a better word, a rave <laughs> at the end of it as well. You, know, you could have an extension of the things that go on and, the, and that, that culture that goes on as well back walking out of the club and seeing some man walking his dog on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that, that's, that's, that's actually not where I want to be anymore. <laughs> but I, I, I fully support anyone that does want to be there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I feel like we, we, that's, that's the moment. That's, the, that's, the, that's yeah. what you're searching for, you yeah. know, because it's in those spaces, we were saying before, it's in those spaces you make friends and you learn how to love and you uh, learn how to connect with other humans. And uh, it's, it's those spaces in that culture that got, I imagine, quite a few of us here, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Good. Any other questions? Hello, thank you. I'm a county councillor from Cambridgeshire, which is a joint coalition administration. So we're all getting to know one another, and we have somebody you know, with colourful hair and some people who wear shirt and ties and so on, and it's all a bit of a shock to the county council officers sometimes. Before I came here, I was writing an email about school transport and antisocial parking, the first lady talking, I thought, you know, this is interesting. I know I won't have much in common. And then she starts talking about transport. And you um, say, we don't need to all agree on it. We just need to throw in what we need and why in a friendly way. That's the way politicians like me like being lobbied. Mm -hmm. In a friendly way, this is what I need and this is why can you help. Okay? Yeah. Not, why don't you do so and so. 
Um, and so, if you're looking for buses, you want them to have as many passengers as possible at many times a day as possible, in many directions as possible. And a lot of people will meet on the bus. So all strength to you. I'm trying to combine school transport with cleaners for the hospital. You're going to do similar simply. You'll find there's lots of other people. It's common cause. Let's all throw things in together and do our best for one another. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we, we found out when we were in Bristol about the late night transport is that in actual fact, we always think about it as people who are going out to pubs and clubs who are using late night transport, but in actual <laughs> fact, it's used mostly by our health professionals. So it's like, oh, that's another ally. That's somebody else to bring into that conversation who can help us with that conversation. And you're right, you know, there's no point in complaining just why is this happening or why is not happening? For us, it's really been about not just engaging, but engaging with evidence and research and showing that here's a better way forward, here are things that you can do, and we want to work with you. We want to support um, good government initiatives. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you for that as well, thank you. Uh, other questions, I think there's one in the front here. Um, one of the speakers mentioned the word anarchism with a laugh, and I just wonder, whether any of you have been influenced either consciously or maybe a bit unconsciously by anarchist ideas? I'll go to you guys, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, probably uh, Socrates, one of the original anarchists. One of the, the things that changed everything how, uh, in terms of how we think and how we work, we spent uh, a lot of time, especially here in this country, thinking about how this needed to change and this party was rubbish and crap views and all the rest of it. And there's a, a, a quote that we heard that transformed everything for us. And it was, and it's been attributed to Socrates, but you know, let, let's, I like the words. But it says, the best way to bring about social change is not fighting the old, it's building the new. So that has been become one of our really founding principles, whereby uh, we will still add our weight and support behind campaigns. And obviously we can't ignore uh, fighting, you know, some of the systems that are there. Otherwise, you know, we, we have to. But we decided to shift our influence. And rather than moaning about why things aren't changing, we decided that we're going to lead by example and just start to create the type of work and life and environment and organisation that we would like to see uh, in other spaces too. So it's not being motivated by money or funding or ego or you know power and status, all of those things. But it's based on good work, on fairness, on uh, you know doing things with joy and positivity and courage. You know, really importantly as well. And so it's why one of, it's why the way that we work is in a very very practical sense. You know, we we. We say love and believe in, in protest and, and the, you know fighting for rights and things as well. But we believe that our particular skill set is around um, actually building projects and being really uh, practically impactful in that way. And we believe that that is challenging an unjust system and offering something in its place as well, which is at the heart of anarch anarchism. <laughs> Good. Any other questions? Oh, we got another one. We spent some of yesterday afternoon walking along the so-called Peace Wall, which for somebody who's only come to Belfast uh, these last few days was a bit of a shock, I must say. Um, I'm just wondering if your kind of community work will help um, Belfast move to a point where the wall can come down. Well, I, I mean, I think we could all sort of talk a little bit about this. Um, I know the work that we all do doesn't directly affect you know, you know, the, the taking down of peace walls, but I'm pretty sure all of the work that we do is having that positive effect and bringing people together. I mean, we, we said this earlier that you know, we're getting to, you know, there's new generations of young people who are coming through that don't really see themselves as nationalist or unionist or Protestant or Catholic, and they want inclusive spaces to go to. They want to feel safe. I mean, I, uh, even as a kid, there was always this element of fear all the time living in Northern Ireland. And even after the peace process, there was that element of fear. And I think over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, it's broken away a little bit. And I think we now feel confident to speak out and say, no, these things are wrong and challenge funding going to UVF paramilitaries. You know, yeah. what happened here last week with uh, there was somebody arrested who was, on, who was meant, to, the day he was arrested, he was meant to graduate from Peace and Reconciliation uh, PhD, and he was getting money to fund youth projects, and he was 
ended up, it was the person that put the hoax bomb on the, uh, for the, our Secretary of State, had to be evacuated from, and he was caught with a load of guns, and we're thinking, wait a minute, the government have been giving him money for these sorts of things for years, and, and projects like ours are not supported well. So, but yeah, maybe uh, any other comments or thoughts on that? Well, I think you touched on earlier um, the importance of dance war culture here. Um, it's really well written about the punk scene, I think, mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland and how that was sort of bringing the two sides together. But actually, um, raves and electronic music did a lot in the early 90s as well. Some people would say it was like one of the main, was, was bigger than the peace process even, like yeah. some people would say. Um, but yeah, it's not very well documented at all and that's something that we also want to try and change. Um, yeah, I think per personally from my own experience, it's been a huge part of me meeting other people that come from a different background and that was, yeah, that was the main sort of. And we, and we are seeing some of those peace walls coming down. Um, and, ho and hopefully we will see more of that happen. Any other comments? I think there's a really important point to be made about our uh, many communities here and that previously a lot of work, you know, the, the phrase cross community was always, you know, bandied about here and it was very important at the time and used to bring people together. But now there are many more than two communities in this country. And, uh, you know, it's representation for things like, uh, you know, whether people with, uh, with disabilities are being represented, whether queer people are being represented, people of colour, you know, it's, uh, those are the issues that are m sort of more prescient in terms of what's happening within culture, but that is not to minimise or take away from, there is still obviously, you know, those, those peace walls often are uh, things that keep people safe and, you know, and we're, we're shouldn't have been, you know, like, let, let's not even like comment on that in the first place, but uh, what, the, the, the dime, I was 18 whenever the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998, so I was that, that raver in the dance floors of the 90s. And I can like absolutely uncategorically like confirm that nobody in any of those spaces, whether it was Shine, the art college, we were talking about like Hellraiser and you know, all of these like sweaty raves, nobody gave one shit where you came from or what your name was, or what way you said H, or what foot you kicked with, or anything about it. Nobody cared. It, it was basically, have you got any VIX, mate? Or have you got any water? Those were the key issues of the time, you know? And now it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's that even more, but in a much more sort of gentle way. It's not hidden away. It's much more part of sort of mainstream culture. When you said, when you said gentle there, uh, what, what was really interesting was listening to a podcast about somebody who, you know, DJed in Northern Ireland through the Troubles and then after the Troubles. And one of the things that they said was, there was an element of tension all the time, but that added to the experience. There was an element of, am I gonna to get to see it here safely? Is everything gonna be okay? And then you get onto a dance floor and the music starts and everybody, I mean, people in Belfast, I mean, I've lived in Manchester, I've been to venues all over the United Kingdom, and you find that there's a lot of people two-stepping outside of the dance floor, you know. In Belfast, people go to the dance floor and that's where they are and they wanna be there and it's, and it's it's intense and a lot of fun. It's, it's a, I mean, for me, and I have to say this, I, since coming back to Northern Ireland from Manchester, initially I was, a, I was one of those people who'd be like, mm, I'll be leaving here again soon. And then I started working for Humanist UK, and then I started to appreciate just what we have here in Northern Ireland. Our creative community is amazing. Our activists are amazing. The people here are amazing. The place is beautiful. We have all of these things that are just amazing. And I think some of the work that Holly and I do as well is thinking about creative drain. We talk about um, that, that sort of uh, the drain, brain drain, so people leaving from, you know, from the universities to go and work somewhere, somewhere else. Well, all of our creatives do that as well because there's nothing really here like supporting them, but they all know they want to be here. It's just that they're saying, oh, we don't have a clubbing scene. You know, I can't get gigs every week. It's hard for me to get, one of the things is, it's hard for me to get a flight from Belfast to the other international destinations I go to. So all of these things are things that we need to change and, and build the infrastructure for in Northern Ireland. And when we have it, we're gonna have an amazing country. I mean, this place is going to be the shit, for want of a better word. We, 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 really, we really are, and, and, I, and, I, and that, I feel that happening all the time, you know, when we when meeting you guys and meeting Katie and meeting other people who are passionate about these things that we do. 
really makes me hopeful and makes me think, oh, you should all move here. Anybody that's come over, you'll be here in a few years' time. It's cheaper to live here as well. You don't want to live in London. One, one We're moving the Humanist UK headquarters here, by the way, next year. Uh, <laughs> Like something that hopefully will resonate with everybody, which is like, you know, we're all very aware that often people who have experienced trauma or have had something that is like a negative experience happen to them often have like, I mean, it's a hippy dippy phrasing, I appreciate it, but hopefully you'll know what I mean. But I have a raised level of consciousness and empathy. And we as a whole country have experienced trauma for very many years. And that has created, like for me, I'm biased, but some of the most empathetic, humorous, and warm, and incredible people, and a lot of the people that have particularly gone away and come back again, and are prepared to roll up their sleeves and help, you know, share some of that diversity and experience and bring some of that back again. You know, we, we really do have like so much here to be grateful for, and whenever we can continue to be grateful, um, then it makes some of the, the more uncomfortable sides of things a bit easier to deal with. It's maybe, like, it's maybe less about peace walls and more about the people that put them up. Yeah. You know, like, let's be real here. They were meant to be here for a few months. They've been here for many, many years. And they are shocking to the outside world. They're shocking also to the people of Belfast. You know, if we're there to spray, a, a, hopefully there's no peelers in the audience or police in the audience, but if we're there to spray a message or we're, or we're, or we're doing our thing in areas in and around the peace walls, um, it is shocking. It's real kind of like a Gaza style mm -hmm. a madness. Um, but it is, unless we, can, unless we can support the communities that are either side of those walls sufficiently in order to um, have enough, so not to uh, sit in a place of blame of the other side, yeah. um, and then take a zoom back and realise what's really, really went on here and what, how we've really been treated, yeah. um, until that happens, um, we, uh, we're, we're not going to get anywhere. But when it comes to Peace Walls, it, um, it comes down to those communities, yeah. you know, yeah. because they are, they're, they're keeping... They're keeping communities safe, yeah, they are, you know. They are. I mean, one of the things, we had a dialogue session yesterday with people from uh, Belfast Islamic Centre and the Baha'i community and others. And one thing we were talking about is the problematic culture, the historic problematic culture of Northern Ireland. But one thing that I think we could all do, whether we were nationalists, unionists, Catholics, Protestants, no matter where our position is, is start to take ownership for our own history in Northern Ireland. You know, it's, everybody should really start to think about it as, you know, if you're a nationalist, you, loyalist culture is also part of your history. <laughs> you know, it is part of it, whether it's problematic or not. You know, it's, it's about taking ownership of it in some ways. And we say, yeah, we're a bit different here, but we'll own this. So anyhow, on that, um, another round of applause for our panel, please. Uh, and thank you very much.